Dr. Adam posed the question. He briefly and en passant posed the question, why do we grow the food so far away from the cities? Why don't we grow the food in the cities? The next speaker is going to answer that question. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, Wayne, that's you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you. If you invite me back next year, I promise to bring you an impossibly delicious broccoli. <laughs> Hi. So um, my uh, idea city idea to present to you is that <clears throat> there are so many health, economic, educational, environmental, cultural, and community benefits to urban agriculture that we don't need to ask about what's the value by the dollar of the food that we produce. Food, in that sense, is simply the icing on the cake. This is my cat, <laughs> whose name is Pausable. And um, she taught me the trick that to solve Rubik's Cube, you can't solve it on one side alone. You have to side it, solve it for six sides. And that is the issue that city planners, who to some extent determine the impossibility of urban agriculture, and provincial and federal agriculture departments who really determine the impossibility now of urban agriculture cannot do to think on all six sides. And that's what I want to really introduce to you uh, today is the notion of six ways, six gifts, to use the last uh, exercise uh, as the way to talk about it, of how we can think in a whole new way about urban agriculture. In the absence of anyone understanding the six gifts, the only time we've really considered it or promoted it seriously is in times of dire emergency. And that was, first of all, in World Wars I and II, when in order to conserve food for the troops, in order to conserve oil for the troops, people were encouraged to grow food in their own backyard or in community gardens. Um, and that was an incredibly successful uh, campaign. It did conserve food for the troops and oil for the troops, and it also built the health and morale of the civilian population, but was immediately demobilized as soon as the war was over. And the next time we've heard about urban agriculture as something that was actively promoted was in Cuba after the collapse of the Soviet Union, when they no longer had a place to sell their sugar for a high cost to cover the cost of the oil and the food imports they needed. And they thought the, the way to grow agriculture is in the city. It's close to the consumer, so we don't need to have transportation. It's close to the consumer, so we can use their food waste to fertilize the soil instead of oil. Uh, and so that's what they've done, and very successfully over the last uh, 25 years. But other than that, there have been no real emergencies, and no one is defining global warming at this moment as an emergency that requires us to use urban agriculture, even though an article written just a few weeks ago establishes that every pound of fruits and vegetables that you grow in your backyard displaces two pounds of carbon dioxide. So it's got an amazing potential, but not one government that signed on to the Paris Accord or not signed on to the Paris Accord uh, has identified urban agriculture as a tool. So I want to go through the six uh, gifts that I think will allow us as citizens to take on what governments that only see one side of the Rubik's Cube have not been able to. And the first is the famous backyard tomato taste. Um, which I'm going to be bringing you that, not for tomatoes, which anyone can do, but for broccoli next year. And I believe that what the taste of freshly picked food from behind your, uh, from immediately in your neighborhood will do is to create a food revolution. 
Because for taste right now, where we get taste from is fat, sugar, and salt. And we have the possibility instead of getting it from real food. And secondly, if you know the trends, about half of the meals that North Americans eat are either eaten at the desk or in the car. So instead of gobbling food that we consume, we need to be engaged in food and to savor it. So I believe that's the first revolution. The first people to get it are the chefs. This is a Noma, the most famous a restaurant uh, in the world, and the chef closed it down for a year so that he could build a farm so that he can cook food that has just come right out of the ground. Um, the second gift is the gift of agriculture, urban agriculture, to help educate ourselves, children, adults, uh, therapy, rehabilitation. This is it on a monumental scale, a school with a green roof in Hangzhou in China, uh, which is not the scale I think we want to use urban agriculture, not the monumental scale, but the human scale of behind the school where kids get a break like we just had and get to get over what is called nature deficit disorder and to experience nature firsthand and to experience inquiry-based learning. And secondly, when they go indoors, if you see what she's working on, it's learning to use your senses as a tool of knowledge and not just computers as a tool of knowledge. So a powerful educational device. They get it in the Netherlands. They pay farmers, some farmers, to be care farmers and to look after children with uh, learning disabilities. And I spent a day with some people who worked with drug addicts a very um, exciting program that's talked about in my book. They get this at, uh, at Bridgepoint, where people are recovering from uh, either a stroke or a traumatic accident. To normalize their rehabilitation over three months, they want community to drop in, friends to drop in. They want people to be able to face up to what they're going to be facing by looking at the beauty of the world around them, and they want them to be able to work their fingers and hands with fine motor motion and hand-eye coordination. So where better to do it than in a rooftop garden? Uh, and the same practices followed in the uh, mental health community-oriented hospital in Thunder Bay, St. Joseph's. Um, so that's the second gift, I think, of uh, urban agriculture. And the third is it can help us establish green infrastructure which is not just a rearrangement of cement and steel so that it conserves energy, but the use of live plants as infrastructure. Here is the future headquarters I uh, just unveiled of Google in London, England, and you can see the massive park they have on the rooftop. That's a green infrastructure masquerading as a walk in the park because that is going to uh, soak down carbon dioxide, pump out oxygen, suck in rain on a rainy day, keep it out of the Thames River overflow, and release it again to the city to cool the city through evaporation the next day. That is the next generation of infrastructure. You can see it closer to home at Ryerson, where they have a quarter acre farm just above the engineering faculty that did a lot of the work on Toronto's uh, green roof bylaw. And, um, this is uh, Arlene Thronis, who is one of the few farmers in Canada, hired by a university. And uh, she works with students who are going through a, a stressful period, giving them an opportunity to farm. She does workshops with uh, architects, studio designers, city planners, uh, nutritionists, and others. Uh, so there's a, a very important role for a farmer in our universities. Uh, some of you know uh, Chocolate Soul. They often win awards as the top uh, tar dark chocolate in Toronto. But they are committed to a circular economy. And this is the infrastructure of the circular economy. You take the shells from the cacao and other food scraps. You put them on the roof. They produce um, the uh, ingredients for your uh, salad that you serve when you sell at the s farmer's markets. So that is what the new economy and a new infrastructure will look like. Almost all cities, including Toronto, are located by rivers and lakes. 
That means that we have drinking water at our hand and we have urban fisheries that are possible. So let's look at them as urban agriculture and what we can do to protect them. Wherever you have a slope heading towards a sewage main, you put a rain garden that soaks up the rain, releases it as evaporation the next day, and why not include some edible plants in that. The Royal York Hotel, take a, a look up at their roof. Um, bees are being killed in the countryside because of insecticides, of course, they get bees and all their pollinators, but here they have a safe home in the city uh, on the top of the Royal York, and they don't pay anything. Um, social cohesion is the fourth gift, and there's two elements, I believe, to a healthy society that's bonding with people you are close to, from a breastfeeding, meals at home, and whatever, and bridging, meeting out to people you hardly ever meet, like at Idea City, and see what happens when your ideas interact. Uh, you often have heard that food is a yuppie movement of the elite. This is a group of the original yuppies in Toronto who started a community gardening in 1982 in Regent Park. And they are, of course, building what is called social bonding in gardening, a number of Chinese seniors reliving old days, the days of transition, and their own transplanting as they transplant food. This is the opposite Will Allen of uh, Milwaukee with his famous livestock, 600,000 red wiggly worms. Um, that he turns the brewery waste from Milwaukee into compost. As it's turning into compost, it heats his greenhouses in weather that is more severe than Toronto's in the wintertime. And his daughter, Erica, who you see with the hat uh, in the middle, deliberately places urban gardens in Chicago at intersections of rich, usually white, neighborhoods and poor, often black, neighborhoods, so that the two get to know each other. Because the secret of the successful cities of the future will be the ability for different kinds of people to collaborate. And uh, here's an experience right from Toronto, right near the Pioneer, uh, Black Creek uh, Pioneer Village. In an area of um, the city that's often uh, portrayed in the media as having a lot of uh, youth problems, and here's some very bad hombres uh, who are working on this farm, and they're learning all sorts of skills, vocational skills, employment readiness skills, leadership skills, uh, that will stand them in good stead. Um, it's when we get to health, I believe that we see the real commercial possibilities and where we see disruption. Um, we think of our cell phones and everyone's aware that, you know, once you had a big room full of a computer, now we just put a cell phone and a computer in your side pocket. Well, this is the farm equivalent. This goes uh, 24-7, 365. At the bottom, there's fish. The fish poop is cycled up to the top where it uh, renews the soil that will grow greens. Okay, it's one, the bottom is a recycled shipping container. And they have two of them in a spare part of the parking lot uh, right near uh, Brickworks. And here are the two micropreneurs, or one of the micropreneurs, Brandon Behor, it works with Stephen Bourne. So micropreneurs producing microgreens that could be feeding us delicious greens all winter long. Uh, and um, in my opinion, there are room in Toronto for tens of thousands of these, especially as the box store malls start to empty out as a result of competition from uh, internet retailing. So this, we could be growing almost all of our greens. Don't just look in old parking lots, though. In the parking lot in near the downtown, where there's a big lunch crowd looking for salads and uh, something green to put on their sandwich, or their hamburger, their meatless hamburger, um, <laughs> This is the kind of efficiency that you can have in a parking lot in Vancouver uh, with the new uh, possibilities. And um, I think one problem we have in our society is we often don't take enough time to smell the flowers. In order to take time to smell the flowers, we have to build the flowers into the city. And um, 
Flowers play a big role. Many flowers are edible, and many are very good for pollinators, which is also good for uh, food. And I, I believe we can have urban agriculture emojis like this all over uh, the city just to inspire us with the power of plants. Uh, green roofs are probably the leading contender in the green infrastructure, but green walls are equally a possibility. Among other things, they attract all the particulate and air pollution on smoggy days that often sends youngsters and seniors to hospitals with air uh, breathing problems, and we can dramatically reduce that with uh, uh, green walls. And it gives us an important lesson that the functional can be beautiful and the beautiful can be functional, which I think is an important lesson for us to learn. And you know that every city needs a tree canopy that's supposed to be 40%, cover 40% of the city. We're leaders in that in large part thanks to the Don Valley parking lot. And, um, uh, but in many parts of the world, they use trees for food production, and we haven't really begun to imagine that. In Canada, we chop down trees in order to grow food instead of looking at them as sources of food. Uh, but I'm here in Honduras uh, doing an evaluation of a food security project, and I'm in a one-acre backyard surrounded by trees, and it, that backyard of trees is feeding a family of one mom and two daughters. And uh, we, can, we need more trees in the city, and we can have many of those trees as trees that produce uh, food and be part of the urban agriculture scene, not only food for humans, but for other diverse species in the world. Thank you very much. So, Wayne, it all seems so sensible. Your arguments are so persuasive. How come there is not a food factory, a high-rise food factory here in Toronto? Well, I think uh, things are changing fast, because I would say um, one of your charming volunteers said to me, well, what are you talking about? I said, urban agriculture. She said, wow, that's hot. <laughs> and then I talked to another one as I was going into the green room here, and she said, awesome. But I must say, the reason why I'm wearing a sports jacket is that when I worked at the city of Toronto, the only comment I got was, you're crazy. <laughs> so uh, I think the world is changing fast, but, but there are powerful forces of resistance. Even in the Second World War, the food industry and the agriculture industry were opposed to urban agriculture. They thought it would steal market share. Mm -hmm. So um, you're saying the resistance now is institutional and has to do with, what, zoning and bylaws? Or? Um, I think um, it's not so much zoning and bylaws, but uh, uh, if you think of a Department of Agriculture, it doesn't do anything. They say we are agriculture, but they only support urban, uh, rural agriculture. They don't give a dime or any extension staff or support or policy work to make it possible. In fact, it's almost illegal to do community composting. So there's no laws to facilitate and certainly no incentives to move in that direction. I know why the Canadian livestock industry might be a little apprehensive about uh, vegan burgers, particularly ones that taste terrific, smell terrific, uh -huh. have the sizzle. Uh, I could even understand why the dairy industry in Canada might be a little apprehensive about a movement to reduce the amount of livestock. But why would anybody object to gardening in whatever environment the garden could flourish in. Well, you know, we hear through nutrition circles that food and vegetables are the main food group. You're supposed to eat five to 10 servings a day. But in fact, less than 2% of the land in Canada grows fruit and vegetables. Hmm. It is actually a, a marginalized section of the whole agricultural industry. And, and most food is grown, half of the grains are grown for beef and, and um, uh, it's very much a grain and beef uh, centered. So part of the hostility, I think, to urban agriculture is a hostility to fruits and vegetables. But I would think the established producers would simply uh, move to this other venue. Anyways, sure. I don't want to perpetuate yeah, yeah. this line. I know that there is a facility in Singapore that is doing well. It's three stories high. What is the tallest structure in the world today devoted to agriculture? Um, I think at the visioning stage, there's some 
uh, by a, an architect named de Pommier, who has got one that's 18 stories high and one in the, the Netherlands, but I think they're only at the planning stage, so it's quite possible yours is the highest. The one I showed you was two stories, but <laughs> it's sort of cheap so because it's so small. Nothing yet built. No. But we so can imagine a day when these high-rise skyscrapers were heading to 80 stories and more here in Toronto, and we've got all kinds of facilities in the base. So I can imagine that two, three floors are given over to hotel, and another two, three floors exactly. are given over to growing lettuce, and then a bunch of condos, and so on, and exactly. so forth. Exactly. We ought to go into business. I okay. Think. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.